Well, thank you to the university for inviting me, and it's been a fairly long day. I've already done two, two sessions here at the podium and one sitting down there. So um, I have to apologize slightly that those of you who've been here all day are going to hear some of the things they've heard already uh, repeated. Um, but hopefully you can do your emails, or you were doing your emails, and this will be fresh. <laughs> Uh, and I can get on and do it. Okay, first thing to say, uh, I work for something called the International Association for the Study of Obesity, uh, which is a non-governmental organization, part of civil society. We have a uh, large professional membership amongst medics and researchers who are interested in the study of obesity. Um, and we are also uh, combined into two, uh, two units of us combined uh, because we include something called the International Obesity Task Force. And this was an advocacy uh, group set up uh, in Scotland, in fact, back in the 90s, and moved to London and joined in with the International Association. But the International Obesity Task Force is much more of a sort of a provisional wing, being out there active and liaising with organizations like the World Health Organization to uh, promote um, obesity policies and particularly prevention of obesity policies um, internationally. And just to confuse you a bit more, we're about to change our name again uh, and become the World Obesity Federation, or World Obesity, um, including the IOTF, IOTF becoming World Obesity Policy and Prevention. And Boyd Swinburne, who was here during the day and has had to leave us, uh, is the chair of IOTF and will become the chair of World Obesity Policy and Prevention. So we're very pleased to have him as our major trustee for that section. Okay, and that's what I spend quite a lot of my time worrying about, is how we're going to develop policy and prevent obesity. So, back to my title. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a sort of mixed bag of a talk, so um, uh, I hope we will have plenty of time for discussion, because I actually want to hear more about what's happening in New Zealand or what you think would make good points uh, for governments and for civil society to be acting on. I don't really want to listen to my own voice all through the time we have available. When I've spoken in meetings such as this, there's often been a few people from the food industry, and when I've raised the very obvious um, usual targets that we've had now for 10 or 15 years about the need to reduce our consumption of fatty foods, sugary foods, salty foods, the industry sits there sort of nodding, yes, that's familiar, they're used to this message, it doesn't really worry them. Um, this actually, these phrases come from the National Action Plan for Sweden, uh, published in 2003, but they went on and did something a bit more and specified how much we should reduce consumption, fatty, sugary, salty foods, 50% basically for soft drinks, and they specified the foods, not the nutrients, and that's an interesting move, shift from just talking about nutrition to talking about food. 50% cut in sugary cereals, fast foods, pastries, cookies. At this point, the food industry people were not sort of sitting there nodding quite so comfortably. There were a few sort of, mm, because that's not so easy for them to take on board, particularly if you really think about what it means in the marketplace. They're not that happy about the idea of cuts in sales of their current portfolio of products. They are, of course, quite keen to develop new products and sell them to us, and sell them to us if they can using these sort of languages. So, you know, reduced sugar soft drinks, fine, they can make some money out of that. But on the whole, the main message is quite difficult for industry to deal with. And this is a trade journal headline, which was quite nicely summarized, how it's not something that any particular company really wants to take on board. Selling less is not what their shareholders want them to do. And I want to say a few words about how, actually, when the industry says we can be part of the solution, the industry has a big investment in people eating too much. And I want to just uh, remind ourselves, I don't have figures for New Zealand, but this is the body weight, average body weight for adults in the USA and in England. And quite interesting, the slope is very similar. It started a bit higher in the States and presumably could go back earlier down to the level for England, so they're just a bit ahead. But the slope is similar and basically shows a nine kilogram increase over about a 30 year period. This is the average weight of an adult. It doesn't mean that over 30 years we all put on nine kilos. That's a very different statistic. No, this is the average weight of adults 30 years ago, 20 years ago compared with now. Gradual increase in the amount of fat that all of us are carrying around. 
obviously some become obese, some aren't. Uh, but on average, that's nine kilos. And that nine kilos all has to be fed, kept warm, moved around with all the rest of your body. So actually, there is an investment there. The industry requires you to eat more to keep those nine kilos from getting frozen out of the rest of you. So I estimated it's about just under 1,000 kilojoules a day to keep nine kilos healthy and happy. Uh, and that's costing New Zealanders uh, a little over a dollar. This is an estimate based on me transcribing from British prices and British figures. So I'm open to question, but it's that sort of order of magnitude. And a dollar a day per adult extra in food consumption is quite a lot of food sales, perhaps as much as two, two and a half billion for New Zealand. But this is me again converting from a UK calculation, and I'm much happier if someone would like to do that within New Zealand on your own figures. But it's that sort of return on investment, not profit. I have to say these are sales, so it's turnover that the industry is benefiting from as a result of having, over those 30 years, put in the extra weight. And that's also, of course, why they might be quite keen to continue marketing, particularly to younger people, particularly to children, to encourage that weight gain as early as possible and get the maximum benefits in return. This is seditious talk I'm giving here, and I hope some of you realize that I shall be shot before I leave the country by someone in the food industry not liking it. Margaret Chan, uh, the director of the World Health Organization, director general, gave a very interesting speech uh, only a few months ago at a meeting in Helsinki on health promotion, where basically she said, you know, it's proving too difficult for us. We've had big struggles with tobacco, but it's moving on. It's now big food, big soda, big alcohol. The world is actually changing its nature. It's not small producers of food. These are large, big companies that we're having to contend with. No single country has managed to turn around its obesity epidemic. And that isn't because of individual failure of willpower. It's a failure of political will. OK, so this is the theme that I want to try and develop a little today. Firstly, I want to say that um, big food likes to describe itself as being part of the solution and can offer lots of um, measures that it will take to help, you, help convince you that it's part of the solution. But I would contend that actually it's part of the problem, particularly big food, particularly branded food, particularly food producers who produce foods that by and large you would uh, be encouraged to eat less of. And so I want to, if you like, open up a division between good food and bad food and suggest to you that big bad food, it tends to be the large multinational corporates who rely heavily on commodities such as starches, fats, oils, sugars for producing the stuff they brand and heavily market. And compare that with, if you like, good food who are your producers, uh, primary producers, secondary producers, wholesalers, distributors of fresh and perishable foods which are largely the foods we should be eating more of. So I'd like to draw that distinction and talk about big food, the corporates, the ones who are producing the branded, generally less healthy foods, foods we generally should be eating less of, and talk a little about the measures they take to say how they're helping solve the problem. So they will offer voluntary self-regulation, um, which I would argue deflects stronger regulation. And they offer things like reformulation, um, and the, a good example is salt reduction, uh, where uh, Campbell's uh, was one company which in February 2010 announced it would reformulate a lot of its soups, reducing the salt levels quite significantly. And then about 18 months later, uh, noticing its sales had sl were sliding quite significantly, the chief executive officer, Denise Morrison, said we're going to have to put the salt back in and have, they have done so. Voluntary self-regulation, nice idea in theory, but if they're the only company doing it, they tend to get pressure from shareholders, they're losing competition, and it gets rolled back. So self-regulation has this inherent weakness that it can easily be rolled back. It's not statutory regulation which is uh, fixed. Uh, another example they will offer for uh, voluntary nutrition labeling. And there's been a lot of discussion, I know, over here, as we have had in the UK, about traffic lights and star ratings and so on. 
UK traffic light um, labeling is voluntary, has been for the last uh, 10 years or so now, and quite a few companies have brought it in. Uh, the one on the left is the recommended food standards agency coloring scheme, with indicating not only colors, but also in words, low, high, medium. The one on the right is one of our largest supermarkets who adopted a color-coded scheme, but their color coding made no sense whatsoever. It was not <laughs> reflecting anything to do with hazard. It was actually just pink for sugar, orange for salt, and so on. It didn't mean anything. So it not only gave us a different set of ways of representing it, but actually, I think, deliberately confused the issue. So with voluntary measures, companies uh, often, uh, there are no sanctions about this. Tesco's did it and have been doing it for several years. They're only now beginning to say, well, we might now adopt traffic lights. So to their credit, they may at last change the tune. But for many years, they've been quite substantially undermining the move to have traffic light labeling across the board. Uh, voluntary self-regulation, well, restricted marketing to children. That's always interesting. Europe, we've had uh, the company pledge, the European pledge by uh, a dozen or more companies, the big ones who do a lot of the advertising of junk food, uh, have made their voluntary pledges. But they tend to be quite lost in the nuances. They will tell you things that they're not doing, but they won't tell you what they're continuing to do. And a lot of their activities have been to move from TV advertising into internet marketing and from internet marketing through to things like direct to your um, mobile phones, smartphones, and so on, and other ways in which they're developing their advertising. So they will say, oh, we're not going to market on television anymore. Well, they don't need to. They're not doing it there so much. Uh, there's a good example of how uh, it's been recognized that that is indeed what they're doing. And here's a good example, just the sort of thing they um, attract children to. And of course, the thing that happens with a a sort of game site like this, is instead of the 20 or 30 second commercial spot that you will see on television promoting Fruit Loops, children will engage with this for 30 minutes or more. And what's more, they will supply details about themselves, give their age, maybe an email address and Facebook contact and the rest of it. It becomes much more interactive, much more absorbing for the child, much more effective uh, at getting the branding message across and much cheaper. They only have to put up a site like this, much cheaper than having to run 30 second slots repeatedly over weeks on television. Okay, so for about 10 years, my organization has been happily promoting lots of ideas for trying to sort out the obesity issue. These are the sort of things that often crop up, um, and I've put question marks beside them because I'm beginning to get unhappy with promoting those. So this actually, um, is not my 10-point plan. It could be, and I'm not going to get too, um, I'm not going to take issue with it too badly, but I just don't think this is enough. I don't think we're getting anywhere with these sorts of measures. And these sorts of measures are the sorts of things that governments have been talking about, encouraging, pushing us towards. But to me, they tend to sort of keep the focus on the individual making the change, they don't really focus on the upstream causes, the big food companies I've been talking about, who are promoting just the reverse. So it seems to me this would be the sort of list that if I was Unilever or Nestle or some of your big companies, I would be quite happy with. I wouldn't see a major problem with these, issue, these sorts of initiatives. And maybe, therefore, we need to get a bit stronger, which is why I want to encourage governments to take firmer action than they have been. We had a meeting in New York uh, last September. Um, a bunch of experts, more, many more than those. We had about 80 people turning up. I managed to capture a few of them there, including your recognized Boyd Swinburne in the corner and a few of us there, um, to discuss, if you like, policies for governments, policies for civil society. And the result of that was an interesting document, which I think has been, oh, it isn't available to you, is it? It was in the work pack during the day. Uh, I have a few copies, uh, or I can give you a stick, or I can send you, much more usefully, off to that um, PDF over there, or if you just type in the IASA thing. 
We produced a briefing document coming out of that meeting, uh, and it's some of the issues I'm pulling out of that document that I will talk about for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we have it open for discussion. Okay, I think the first thing to do that we have to recognize that public health is in a very weak position, and that's why we all look rather gloomy a lot of the time. Public health within a ministry is usually the sort of Cinderella bit. It's not the exciting bit, big hospitals, big budgets, uh, all your primary practices, all your services and so on, ambulances rushing around. Those are sort of things that, that uh, attract attention and allow the ministry to sort of say things. Um, but public health within that, preventing diseases, not a lot of interest in that. It tends to get the smaller budget. Ministries of health themselves, or departments of health themselves, are in the cabinet one of the weaker members. They're a spending, not a money creation part. They're not like a department for business or for trade or for industry or the treasury, which controls it all and determines economics. Those are the big hitters. Uh, the Ministry of Health is just a spending pit and it doesn't have such a powerful say in government. So public health weak within a ministry, the ministry weak within cabinet. Public health, therefore, easily overruled at government level. And somehow we have to try and push back against that. We have to develop a stronger voice. And the experience, certainly in the UK, and I think probably here too, is, oh, well, let me give you some experience first about the, the sorts of trouble, trouble you get um, trying to push back against it. I'll start with um, a code of marketing. I'm going to have a dimension here across the top from health protection, which is where I come from, through to wealth creation, which is basically industry interests and promoting uh, consumption, I would say overconsumption. And I want to talk a little about the World Health Assembly's uh, resolution on code of marketing, which it actually weakened after a commercial lobbying from national delegations and the USA particularly, to being a set of recommendations. So where it had started with wanting to produce a code, softened a bit to become a set of recommendations. WHO is rather nervous about telling governments what to do because after all it is the servant, if you like, of all governments together. So it was quite easily persuaded not to issue a code but to issue a set of recommendations thanks to that sort of influence. So already we've shifted slightly from a strong position. When the recommendations were actually circulated, uh, it, they were criticized for not having convincing evidence, so they were softened a little. So the working paper had to respond to um, convincing evidence and acting proportionately. A little bit of a shift further across. Draft recommendations put out, consultation with stakeholders, particularly commercial stakeholders, attacking it. So the draft recommendations, again, sort of slightly more industry friendly. And that's what went off to the World Health Assembly uh, for discussion and approval. They were approved, but there were lobby groups contending, particularly from the commercial sector, again, wanted more convincing evidence, wanted more um, proportionality. And so again, they tended to get a little softer, a little bit moved across to the middle. So when they were finally put to ministries of health, they were now running sort of, I would estimate, somewhere down the middle there. And then ministries of health, if you like, start at that position and have the same sequence of consultations and so on. By the time they get to be proposals to cabinet, they've already gone through consultations, gone through lobbying processes within the ministries of health, and the softer proposals are going to cabinet. Proposals to cabinet tend to get attacked then immediately by the industry interests or the commercial economic development or the rest of it, um, and they tend to get weakened a bit further. They get modified, proposals go out for public consultation, may get some support from consultation, but the commercial stakeholders will also be responding to that. They get another bite at the cherry, and you get these final proposals, which on the whole, um, when they, you consider that they had gone for quite a strong code of marketing at the beginning, end up with a voluntary code of conduct and a social marketing or education campaign. I don't know if any of you have seen that Australian series, The Hollow Men, about uh, three years ago, they had a wonderful one on obesity, which started off with the minister inadvertently saying on a radio interview that he was going to tackle obesity with firm positions. And after the half-hour program, 
he'd ended up with a voluntary code of conduct and social marketing campaign education. That's the political process, and that's an example of how public health starts off having these definite positions it wants to take, you know, tobacco labeling, health, health issues on tobacco labeling, and they get slowly weakened, and it takes a long time before you can push them back to where you want to be. Alcohol, the same. All of us in various different parts of public health, I think we'll recognize the way in which the consultation processes, the stakeholder processes, push the dialogue across, rarely in your direction. And I just wonder how often the reverse happens, how often uh, industry favorable policies, trade policies, World Trade Organization codes get consulted on properly by the public health community. How often we can start taking some of their issues across in our direction, proper health impact analysis for health in all policies. Rare, difficult. You do get business impact um, analyses and even environmental impact analyses, but you don't get health impact analyses in a lot of government work. So I should argue for that. I do indeed. Oh, that was just a nice um, picking up uh, Gabrielle Jenkins' lovely stuff about the framing of the problem here in New Zealand. Indeed, matching almost exactly how public health starts off from that position, you get a report of an inquiry, you get the government's problem description, the government's solutions, the government's action moving across that spectrum towards the industry view. So I, um, I'm quite confident that my previous slides fit your local context. Thank you, Gabrielle, if she's still here. So back to our questions of recognizing the weakness of public health within the cabinet. We need to perhaps address uh, the issue on two fronts. Firstly, there's the human rights front, and that's always a useful one. It doesn't have a lot of traction with the Treasury or the Trade Department, Business Department, but it does have quite a bit of traction uh, in the community, in parents and children, the rights of children. These sort of things can influence voters, so it is a route to go down. And the other is to tackle the Treasury trade business issue head on and say, well, actually, public health has a cost, and the cost is being borne by health services, obviously, and the insurance industry is no doubt making something out of that. But it's also borne by families. It's borne by the workforce. So other companies are suffering from the um, loss of productivity that you get when uh, people become ill. And if obesity is leading people to have back disorders, joint disorders, or heart problems, or diabetes, they are not going to be as productive. That's the issue there. And you can point that out. So you can actually set some industries against other industries and point out the costs of our current um, obesogenic environment. So there are two actions to be taken there. I'm not sure they're really actions to government. I suppose, really, although I've called this actions for government, they're actions for advocacy to government and actions for civil society to pick up and work on and encourage governments to do. So actually governments can fund research to make the economic case. We had the UK um, Foresight Report. Government funded, looked at the cost of obesity to not only the health costs but the product productivity costs, the social costs, the economic costs. And that was a government-funded initiative. Very helpful in then making the argument that obesity had to be tackled. We could make the case if we wish, although I know the, there are some dangers in doing that, but for specifying that there are, there are particular food categories that could be tackled, perhaps for taxation purposes or other marketing purposes, focusing on snacks or soft drinks or products to children when it comes to marketing. That requires a bit of effort too. We can't just expect it to happen overnight, but there are two valuable tools that need to be developed to do that. Food-based dietary guidelines, and I had a hunt on uh, New Zealand health websites or government websites for some New Zealand food-based dietary guidelines. You're hiding them remarkably well. I gather the Heart Association has some, but government guidelines, no. And it really helps to have them because you need to make the case that some foods are 
officially we are being encouraged to eat less of, and other foods officially we're encouraged to eat more of. You need that consensus statement with government authority behind it if you're then to say, and therefore we want to control some foods, limit the marketing of some foods, promote the marketing of others. So it really helps to have food-based dietary guidelines. There are Australian ones, rather generic, not very specific, but they help. I haven't... There are. There are. Oh, good news. Where are you hiding them? Not where I could find them, but I tried. Excellent. Sorry, excellent. I'm delighted they're there. Um, I won't embarrass you by asking if any of you have seen them. You can work from those then to develop the next step, which will be a nutrient profiling tool. And I gather you have actually moved some way in doing that by having a rather simple nutrient profiling scheme for regulating what food products can be advertised to children at particular times of day. So again, you are developing those, and so I would recommend strengthening those, persisting with those. They are very helpful tools to categorize foods, not just for marketing to children, but you could think of many other areas where categorizing foods and specific products into those you want to encourage greater consumption and those you want to discourage consumption can be a really valuable um, uh, method uh, you could do it for taxing, you could do it for government contracts and so on. There are a number of ways for local planning consent for new uh, businesses and so on. A number of ways you might want to use nutrient profiling to help you um, move policy forward. Okay. We do need to encourage regulation. I've talked about self-regulation uh, and it is very disappointing how self-regulation can lead us off into areas that don't have the effect that we really want. Having said that there is a cost to obesity, you need to make it absolutely clear to governments that that cost is not being borne by the companies that are causing it. So the polluter, as it were, is not paying the costs of the pollution. Food companies are not having to pay for the costs of selling more food, excess food, overconsumption of food. Because by making that argument, you can then tackle the very basic economic arguments about uh, whether a market is functioning properly. And when a market is not functioning properly, a government is entitled and perhaps should intervene. So you can make the case for government intervention on the basis of market failures. And the market fails if it is not properly taking externalities, these costs, um, into the price of the product or in some way adjusting the uh, or encouraging an adjustment of the consumption of the product because of its costs, its external costs. So that is a justification for market intervention. And there are others. There is a rational choice argument. Um, traditional classical economics argues that the consumer acts rationally. I think we can show quite well that consumers do not act very rationally, particularly with food, even more so with alcohol after the first drink or two. Rationality goes out of the window. So rationality as a, um, as a classical economics argument uh, can be challenged. And on the basis of that challenge, you can say we can intervene. So, for example, children are not deemed to act fully rationally, and yet we allow this heavy marketing of um, soft drinks, soft uh, snack foods and so on, to children. We can intervene on the basis of that being a market failure, not a perfect market. So then, then we can move to say, well, how would then a government want to strengthen its arms? And I think it's perhaps civil society, our duty to encourage a stronger public health act, a public health act which permits a ministry to act on exposure to risk, which is quite tricky, but it has been done. You will not be the first country to attempt to do this. Uh, amongst others, the uh, government of British Columbia, Canada, uh, has uh, very much a public health act that permits the minister to act to reduce what, what the minister judges to be a risk, and that can include marketing to children, it can include licensing of fast food premises, and so on. So they can see dietary hazard in the long term like that, inducements to risk-taking behaviors. And I would go one step further, not only um, uh, permit a minister to act, but require a minister to act. They can't just sit back and watch these things happen. That would be really helpful. A stronger Public Health Act, great. 
Just to remind us about the forces against which the minister will be having to act, um, of global advertising, a quarter of global advertising is for just those issues that we in the public health community are most concerned about, food and fast food, alcohol and tobacco. $139 billion, so half a, out of half a trillion dollars being spent annually on advertising these products. Uh, well, no, a quarter of that is advertising these products, $139 billion. Um, that's sort of in order of your GDP, I think, your New Zealand's gross domestic product, being spent promoting around the world these products. Okay, UK experience. Um, figures in the UK, we, have, we haven't been able to collect more recent data, but a nice little study was done by the government back in 2003 4 which acknowledged that the government was spending seven million on promoting healthy diets at the time when the food industry was spending 743 million promoting its products, most of which, of course, are not promoting healthy diets, not encouraging healthy diets. And to put that another way, that is um, what the government spends in a year, the industry is spending about every three days, every three days. So simply counter-advertising obviously would not be enough, which is why some of my suggested things about what to do about education or government social marketing, you know, you have to think, oh, is that going to be enough? Okay, time to build some political support. If the government wants, if, if, <laughs> if there are any MPs who want to encourage a stronger public health act, they need to build some public support to push that through. Uh, and I would encourage governments to strengthen their alliances. There are a lot of sympathetic voices, not well coordinated always, but could be um, and need to be built into alliances. And a little bit of government funding for these can go a long way. Uh, there's a very interesting case in Mexico. The uh, Bloomberg Foundation, that's uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York, very good pro-public health, Bloomberg Foundation asked itself, what could it do about obesity? Could it take a sample country like Mexico in this case and intervene in some way with a major grant, $10 million they had to spend? And they asked a lot of very interesting questions about how they should spend $10 million in Mexico to counter the obesity epidemic there. And a lot of obvious suggestions came up about you know, schools, better nutrition in schools perhaps, uh, Drink, drinking water, public drinking water, because there's a lot of soft drinks consumption, public education campaigns. No, in the end, they've spent that 10 million last year, uh, over the next two years too, on supporting civil society groups lobbying governments and paying for civil society uh, adverts on underground, on the metro services, on television, uh, lobbying for changes in the law for taxation on soft drinks and junk food. And within a year, they've got it. There's a lot of public support. Uh, civil society managed to out-lobby MPs and embarrass MPs about their industry lobbying and the connections to industry. And they have pushed through, remarkably, uh, a law which puts a tax on soft drinks and on some junk foods. So that sort of alliance, civil society alliance, doesn't need a huge amount of money and can be very effective, and that's really interesting to see. And I have to say, they didn't do it alone. They had backing, um, research backing from their National Institute of Public Health, which was very sympathetic. So civil society, in alliance with researchers, with medical professionals, can be a very powerful voice. But they have to get into that alliance. You need to develop that alliance even more strongly. I know you're halfway there already, and if I was to rate New Zealand, which we might do at the end, uh, I'm sure we would find it scores fairly well. Okay, another lesson from history is that you need to establish cross-departmental working groups within government because no single ministry, no single department is going to be adequate to deal with this. You might need a lead department, but you need a cross-industry, a cross-sector, cross-departmental task force because a lot of other sections are involved. Transport's involved, education is involved, social welfare and benefits are involved. There's a lot of areas of government that are involved in preventing obesity and controlling, if you like, poor diets, sedentary behavior and so on, influencing it. Need to be involved. 
and you need someone to keep an eye on them. So you do need a monitoring agency, perhaps a um, independent national, sorry, a missing word, National Obesity Observatory or agency who can report to Parliament, preferably not to the politician involved in producing the, the strategy, but to Parliament who can debate it and um, challenge the ministry if needed, uh, and openly publish. Uh, and it should have uh, an annual report with targets showing how these are being reached, what the policies were, whether they're getting anywhere with them, and monitor the drivers of the diets, the food prices, the school food catering, the advertising, so on. All the things we know need to be done, but need to be perhaps a little better coordinated in order to keep an eye on government, hold government to account. Okay, governments actually have more powers than they're willing to um, admit. Um, they can use regulation for better public health promotion and protection. Uh, they can use standards to limit children's exposure to advertising and brand promotion. I would encourage them to do so. They can introduce direct sales taxes. Uh, it's usually better if they do that by suggesting that they hypothecate the income, that is, make sure that the income from sales taxes for junk food are put towards some health-promoting purpose or some other uh, positive purpose. Um, they can talk about salt, trans fat, and sugar standards. They can... Uh, suggest catering. There's an interesting example from Finland. Main dishes sold in Finland should include vegetables with no extra cost. Simple measure. Nice one. Um, and by setting those standards, they act as a beacon of good practice. So um, government's own institutions and anything that it licenses or inspects can include criteria for food provision. So when they inspect a school, they include the provision of food in their inspection. When they are responsible for inspecting old people's homes, food supply should be included. Kindergartens, hospitals, prisons, police. There are a large number of institutions government has some control over. And what's more, in some cases, the government actually is responsible for supplying those institutions. And I would argue strongly that we should be using government purchasing power and the contracts it has to build a market for quality produce, to actually use its purchasing power. And what's more, if it wanted to be politically popular, it can specify locally sourced. It can do that on sort of greenhouse gas uh, issues, but it would also uh, be of enormous benefit to New Zealand producers if it wanted to include that one in as well. And that, that could be a political plus so combining those two, public health and greenhouse gas, into one uh, set of specifications for contracts. And they could be a bit more muscular about their contracts too, because uh, if a company, if you have a voluntary star rating labeling and a company is refusing to uh, put that on their products, maybe they shouldn't be included in the list of people who are favored for contracts. So you use your contracts as part of your leverage for getting some of the changes that you might get from industry. Um, even if you haven't brought in regulation. Ah, well, there we are, same issue again. Use it to influence food supplies. Regional development goals. There's a whole way in which government actually acts beyond its contracts. So I'm expanding here to talk about using health criteria for its development grants, its regional grants, its support for small communities, its support for uh, industry developing new products. We had an interesting example I found that the UK government was, uh, through its business sector, funding lots of little research projects for medium companies, including one which was about how to spray chocolate on a product more evenly. I thought, what is the UK government using public money for to encourage the spraying of chocolate onto a product? No. So, you know, good example. Health in all policies, we need governments to be aware of these. And if there had been any sort of health audit of the research grants it was issuing. Um, that would be quite interesting to check. And a health impact assessment. So as I said earlier, health impact assessments alongside what already occur in many places, which are environmental and business impact assessments. We need the health impact assessments too. My time is running out. Uh, and lastly, I want to lift the lid a bit because why we don't get all the other nine things active is because of the fierce lobbying that is undertaken, not only by the industry, which it does uh, in very large numbers, 
but actually by other departments with, within the government. So that, as I said earlier, Treasury has huge interests not to do many of the things that I'm hoping they would do. But the lobbying by external uh, industry-funded sources is immense, and we shouldn't forget that. I don't have figures for New Zealand. I do for the US Congress. US Congress consists of 100 senators and 441 representatives in the House of Representatives. It has 256 alcohol lobbyists hanging around them, 174 tobacco lobbyists, and 327 food and beverage lobbyists. Vastly outnumbering, or greatly outnumbering, uh, the number of congressmen themselves. The industry puts a lot of money, and these are quite highly paid lobbyists, mostly lawyers, into ensuring that anything that goes on in government suits them best. Uh, we saw this earlier today from Gabrielle. UK example, food giants wooing the ministers with a whole load of meetings between the food, food industry and our public health and uh, secretary of state for health in our government. Uh, if I've just got one or two minutes, why not? Um, you've all come this long way. You don't need to go rushing home, I hope. I just want to say something about the language of obesity and who, who benefits from the sort of narrative of obesity. I mentioned this earlier today for those of you who were here earlier, and I just want to raise the issue one more time about how we think about obesity and in whose interest it is that we think about it in this way. What is the story about it? I want to remind you that um, the media is a very powerful, potent conveyor of the social norms of the day and how the media portrays obesity is often the way we unwittingly think about it ourselves. Looking at some UK recent stories in the UK about obesity, we tend to get pictures of headless people uh, and they're engaging in very stereotypical behavior, eating unhealthy foods. I'll give you a few examples, there's one. You probably have similar ones in your media, it'd be interesting for someone to do a few studies of that. You probably have already, I'm sure you're onto this. But these are the sort of pictures you get. Uh, they're not attractive. They make it look as if you would not want to be anywhere near this person. Not only you. There's an interesting study in the US about doctors and nurses and obese patients. And one quarter of nurses admitted finding it difficult to touch an obese patient. The whole narrative about obesity being something repellent is really, really difficult and puts so much pressure on individuals to avoid it. It's all up to you and so on. I think we need to change that. There is a website that provides alternative media pictures for obese people that makes them a lot less um, repellent. And I think it's really important we think about how we are told about obesity day after day uh, through the media. These sort of pictures are much less um, off-putting even someone who's, you know, got a doctorate. Um, we haven't really got time, but I would love to run through those issues and ask how New Zealand is scoring on, you know, where it thinks public health is in its government uh, thinking, uh, how you're building a case for controlling it, and so on. We won't do that, but I will leave you the slides if you want to do that for yourself, um, including challenging stereotypes as well. Uh, just as an advert at the end, I do want to remind people that uh, here in New Zealand you have leadership on monitoring obesity and the obesogenic environment. Boyd Swinburne in Auckland has been leading a group, a network, international network on Informus, which is the international network for food and obesity research, monitoring and action support, which is advocacy. Um, and it's doing that uh, looking at a range of issues, both public and private sector at the top there, a number of food environments it's trying to measure, uh, and a number of outcomes from those, some of which other people are doing already, so we don't need to be worried. But this is a major initiative that Boyd is doing. It needs a bit of funding, like advert there. Um, and if you want to look at some of the background data, there's a free copy of Obesity Reviews online. Uh, you can go and find it for yourself. If you type in Inform Us, and obesity reviews, I'm sure you'll come across it. And I think with that ad, I better stop. Thank you. It's to see if he was working forward to generate some discussion. So, questions? I'm uh, Tosh Danny. I want to ask you to comment on 
find it fascinating that obviously a very new area of looking at the organisms in your gut. In fact, me, Steve, I wonder if you could comment on um, obesity as a social disease. I'm a pediatrician and I see a lot of these children, and for many years I would bring them back and repeatedly say, oh, you haven't lost any weight. We all do the same thing, we've all decided we're not going to bother bringing them back, we've just given the, the advice about what we think they ought to do, and then we send them on their way. And there haven't been many successes. Um, but the successes that have been, and I'd like to comment on this, have been where the whole family has actually turned around. And I, I, your, your talk talks a great deal about you know the individual and what we can do to try and prevent the individual from being exposed to all these terrible things, but there is another component, isn't there, which is, is this to some extent a symptom of the social disease of our society? So, or even an economic disease, I mean, in a sense, the, the pressure towards overconsumption, the encouragement of overconsumption. There's no business interest in reducing it, so there are no major sort of economic forces to encourage us to consume less. Uh, so, yes, I think uh, it is a hugely social-wide issue. That said, within families, there, are, um, there is some interesting evidence that actually working with parents rather than the child can be more effective once you've talked through with the parents. But I think you have to, to, work, you have to ensure the parents are anxious enough about it to be motivated to do something. Perhaps move them from anxiety into perhaps a bit more about anger in the way that their children are exposed to influences um, in order to encourage them to be more active both for their own child and perhaps even wider into the community, joining the PTA for the school or the uh, governor's boards and so on, thinking about how their children are fed at school, thinking about what happens in sports events, um, and then also making the bigger issues. You know, if, if we don't have a parent complaining about ads on TV, nothing will change. So as a pediatrician, uh, you're in a very valuable position because they will listen to you where they won't listen to a lot of civil society groups going on in the media. So you have some influence there, um, and I would encourage that to be used, um, if you like, to raise their anxiety levels. <laughs> Sounds terrible, but to raise their concern levels about they can do something, but they're in a much wider context in doing that. So it will be a struggle for them, and you are recognizing it's a struggle for the individual, but how can they you know, act more socially to challenge that? But I agree. I mean, in a sense, this is the, a problem of capitalism, is the problem of inducing overconsumption amongst us all. And it's, it's pretty recent, you know, for food particularly, for alcohol, not so, tobacco, gone in a while. But uh, food, you know, the last 20, 30 years has seen this major flood of low-cost food, thanks to low-cost oil, low-cost energy. Uh, we get major low-cost food supplies, mostly of the commodities, starches, oil, sugars, and so on, into our supply. So I hope that, well, it's not an answer. I mean, do you have, have ways that you're trying to approach it that perhaps we, we can learn from? Um, I know we get an opposite uh, experience, which is a family that, uh, where the outcome was a disaster and where the mother never gave me something out that the child was actually it, it could be difficult. We've had the same problem in the UK with our obesity monitoring service and the huge question as to whether you should write to the parent giving the results and what reaction you'll get. If you have no service to offer particularly, um, you know, is it really helpful to tell a parent? But um, yeah, there are issues. <laughs> if anyone else has a, has a constructive answer that I'm forgetting, then please um, contribute. Um, the reaction that you tried of saying you can neither tell a parent over 30 years was very striking. Um, is there a, has anyone done a calculation to find out what the annual cost is of each marginal kilogram that we're carrying around with us as a population hmm. on an individual basis. That would be a nice thought. No, I mean, you could probably subdivide that dollar and a bit and say that each, ten, each kilo is an extra 10 cents food per day. I don't know. I, I'm not enough of a statistician. I wouldn't want to jump to conclusions there. But, you know, every few ounces extra requires that much more food input. I'm thinking of the health benefits if you saved yes. a kilogram on. Yes, it may actually be harder to say to take those nine kilos off again. It's very easy to put on nine kilos, much harder to take them off, and so it may cost you much more um, to find ways of not eating so much <laughs> or moving from unhealthy diet to a healthy diet. So there are issues about 
costs in both uh, costs and savings. Hi there, just a question on whether you have any experience from overseas about um, the possibility for either GPs or hospitals running weight loss or obesity or health clinics. It occurs to me that in every speciality we see patients who struggle with obesity from all ages and we have no service to direct them to that doesn't cost them money and most of our patients, even though we tell them they need to lose weight, they won't because they can't afford the gym or can't afford dietitians and can't afford the healthy food we tell them to eat. So they can come to diet clinics, they can come to diabetes clinics, they can come to renal clinics, but we have no free service for anybody to come to to get advice and monitoring and checkups and support around actually losing weight and living healthy. No, I mean, I fully appreciate that weight management is an extremely difficult uh, issue, as we were saying a minute ago, and I, you know, I'm sorry <laughs> if New Zealand doesn't um, include in your health insurance or your primary care services free access for those who already need help. And most of my talk was about prevention of obesity, not about managing weight uh, or trying to lose weight. But um, it, it is a huge problem. Uh, it would be very expensive, obviously, to provide it freely to everyone who is already overweight and or obese. And um, that's probably the resistance you're meeting, is if you provide it to one, you're going to have to provide it to a very large proportion of the population. I wonder if uh, the failure for our ability to control obesity is because we're giving the wrong messages about the type of food. I see that you're giving the message of reducing the amount of food. Is it the type of food that is important? What do you think of a low-carb uh, type of diet where you can eat as much fat and protein as you like? It seems to be fashionable. Do you think there's any scientific basis for this? If it cuts your total calories, I would, I would um, assume that's the main method by which you're actually losing weight. Um, whether it's sensible nutritionally, I don't want to um, give a professional, because I'm not a professional, give a professional view on that. Um, and similarly, things like the 5-2 diet, you know, two days off and five days on for food consumption. You know, there are a number of diets, a number of different um, promoters of diets. Uh, I do get worried sometimes about the commercialization of weight loss um, and the people who then develop a vested interest in offering you weight loss that doesn't work because they want you to keep coming back. So I'm, I, but that's me being rather cynical about the way in which weight loss industries develop. Um, individual diets I don't want to comment on today. Thank you. Maybe one last question. Yeah. Thank you, that's very interesting. Um, my name is Caroline Gordon. We, my colleagues and I, we uh, are all part of a program called Green Prescriptions, which is a bit of an individual Ministry of Health funded approach to look at uh, promotion of physical activity and nutrition. Um, but it's very limited in terms of the scope of what we can do. It does unfortunately rely to a large extent again on individuals, individual action, which is you know part of the paradox that we work with, and also the fact that the individual is not necessarily still in the whole of this agenda environment. But <clears throat> hats off to the Ministry of Health for at least supporting that in a certain way. What I'm more interested in on the policy level is um, separate to the sign of small scale producer. Um, it seems to me that there's got to be a stronger link between. Um, of carbon emissions and saving the planet, if you like, and the whole food production. And I'm, I'm conscious of the example that was given many years ago in Cuba, for example. Some people may know about it, where there was a market petrol um, and oil embargoes, and it led to a much healthier nation overall because everybody had to produce food locally, they had to, you know, promote exercise and so forth. I'm interested on a policy level if you're aware of any international trends which are actually linked the two things around climate change, carbon emission, and so almost given more of an urgent spin, not, not from a food policy, but more from a kind of carbon protection, which inadvertently leads to the same thing. Thanks. Uh, I'm aware of the fact that there is not sufficient um, overlap between um, the needs of the public health community for food and nutrition change 
and the needs of the environment movement and the global warming um, activities that need to be undertaken to resist that. We need much better integration. I agree with you there. Um, I'm not aware, although someone can probably remind me. We, I mean, we've had a series of Millennium Development Goals for um, world development, for economic development, which have not properly looked into those issues. They expire in 2015. There is at the moment quite a lot of debate about how the post-2015 economic development agenda will get set. Health itself is having a struggle to get in there. Uh, if it can form an alliance perhaps with other um, civil society issues, then it might have a stronger basis and there could be a more integrated, but I'm pessimistic about these things, mostly because these agendas tend to get set by ministries in treasuries and business and uh, world trade and the rest of it, and we have this long struggle to have our voice heard. But I don't want to be too pessimistic. Let's try and be positive. New Zealand has an opportunity. I think New Zealand's scorecard will come out mid-range, not at the bottom. Uh, and, you know, you have an election coming up. Things can change. Things can change quite rapidly. So, you know, good luck. Good for you. <laughs>